dream to say Till on that cross as Jesus died God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live You see those words, for every sin on him was laid Therefore, here in the death of Jesus Christ, our Savior, I live. I want us to sing another song that is, it's not new. It's basically 25 or 30 years old, but it talks about three words that I think we need to be living every day that we live. Let's try this with me together. Holiness, holiness. Is what I long for Holiness Is what I need Holiness Holiness Is what you want from me Faithfulness Sing it with me together Faithfulness Faithfulness is what I long for Faithfulness is what I need Faithfulness, faithfulness Is what I want from me Sing that chorus So take my heart And form it Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. That last verse, righteousness, righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need Righteousness, righteousness is what I, what you want from me So take my heart and form it Take my mind, transform Conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Sing that chorus once again. So take my heart, conform it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it. Yours, to yours, oh Lord. Sing that last line. To yours, to yours, oh Lord. One more time. To yours, to yours, oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for today. Thank you for a day of life that we can live serving you. And Father, may our heart truly be transformed to be more and more like you. We lift all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome, welcome. Thanks, guys, so much. Now your job is to sneak out without making a sound, so good luck. But thank you guys, seriously, for coming in here prior to rehearsal and making it all happen. I hope you guys have had a, a great Wednesday. It's been good, even with a little rain. It's nice. And Sunday night, I tell you, um, <clears throat> I'm kind of a hymn kid, and I've always loved hymns, but Sunday night was a neat experience. If you were here for the hymn sing, and uh, Bob just did a tremendous job, tons and tons of planning on his part in prep and what I liked was he went ahead and took out the verses we weren't singing, so we didn't have to figure out what was going on. It sure did help a lot. And those of you who were in the, the choir and the men's group and all that, it was just tremendous. So one of the things that he mentioned, sorry, I'm going to close these doors. One of the things he mentioned was uh, counting our blessings. And I wanted to take just a second and, and do that. I wanted um, each of you, or 
Some of you just to share the things that you're most thankful for. What do you count as a blessing in your life? And let's speak it out. Uh, today may have been different from yesterday or somebody who may have been a blessing. It's no longer a blessing, but, um, but count. Uh, what are some of your blessings? Jesus, good health at your age. That's true, absolutely. So, no, definitely, sure. Hey. That's awesome. Awesome. Church, family, very good. Sunday school class, no doubt. I have a group of people that um, that are always there and put up with your stuff and everything. So good. What else? Christian brothers and sisters. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. wonder what people would do without a, a group like that. Music, Music, yeah. Yeah. Say that louder, sir. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Our church staff, man, we got, it's, we have an inc incredible staff. They're so fun. They really are so fun. Friends, Friends definitely. And a group of teenagers. Unbelievable. Crazy. That's right. They, it's really a, are so neat. And, and I'm, I'm blessed just because my kids get to be a part of that. And, and so I'm just so thankful for these families that are uh, bringing their kids knowing that there are um, ministers and staff and other kids that are just going to continue to encourage and to hold accountable and equip. So super, super. Anything else? Denise? I think God's unconditional love there you go. Yeah. Sometimes we think, God, how could you? So he, you're not laughing at me crying, are you, Jeff? Nope. Okay, just saying. Fantastic. Tons and tons and tons. Were you saying something, Andrew? Oh. Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. Um, but so much to be thankful for. So many blessings. And as we um, look tonight, take out your uh, kind of your listening guide, your announcement sheet. If you didn't get one, there's some at the door and pens. Follow along. <clears throat> but you'll see some of our prayer needs. We've got some that are in the hospital. Some of you, uh, you know details about a lot of these folks. David and Tom and Jesse, uh, Michael Tedder. Michael Tedder is one of our, our guys at Independence Place, and they just put him in ICU. Uh, Brandon, you see those families that have lost a loved one that we just want to cover in prayer. Just be there for those families. Brandon is in surgery now. Is in surgery now, okay? Thank you. Brandon Carter, he's the one at the Toronto Western Hospital there, Sammy. Anyone else you want to add to this? Yes. That's right. Yes. Is it? Is it not in there? That's interesting. Yeah, they, it's on our other sheet. But yes, this is uh, Gary and Judy and I. That is Jude of uh, Eric and Ashley Thamaris and family and the loss of her grandfather. It's also Judy Knight's father, who is also part of the church. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Anything else? <clears throat> and I and I would be remiss to know that we all bring in um, things that are near to our heart, uh, unspokens. I know as we pray as a staff in the mornings, when, in staff meeting when we were praying Tuesday, uh, all around the, the staff table, uh, just with our guys, every one of us had something, a uh, family member, a situation, uh, something going on. So I know you guys are the same. We're bringing it all in and uh, I'd, we'll join together and bring it before the throne and um, ask God to always be the answer like he, he's so faithful to promise to do. So um, anything else before we go to the Lord in prayer for these folks? Yeah. Absolutely. All right, let's spend just a few minutes and um, take all these names. You can 
look through this list as we pray. You've heard specific needs. You've heard there are people on here that you recognize that you know. Of course, Brandon, who's in surgery right now, um, for unspoken maybe in your own life that you know about, that nobody else may know about. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You just spend just a few minutes just praying for those on that list. Father, we know you've heard us. We're so thankful that we're able to come to the God who created us, the King of all kings, the God that knows our heart right now, our mind, our struggles, the things that, the things that consume us, the God who knows our family members who are hurting or who are sick, the burdens on our heart. Father, that you are in the middle of Brandon's surgery right now, we just pray. We pray that you just be in that room and you be in the lives of those doctors and nurses. We lift up this family of this eight-year-old that you know so beautifully. Father, may they sense your presence in the middle of a very, very deep valley. <clears throat> Father, we do give all of our praises to you. All those things that we continue to see your hand in our life. Those things that we count as just such a great reward. Father, we pray for Grace Champion. Will you be in the middle of the next step? 11 years has been a long time. And Father, today, tonight as we open your word, will you allow it to be real and be refreshing? May you use Heath as he speaks your name. There's nothing more beautiful, more wonderful, more powerful than the name of Jesus. We lift all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm thrilled tonight that Heath is coming to share. I love hearing him talk and teach and open up God's word. So let's do that tonight. Heath, come on. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, good evening. Glad you weathered the storm and made your way out here tonight. Using this. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, no, just to make sure I can see This messes up the mic, Chad. Just yell at me. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's always an uh, incredible time to gather and just... Open the Word of God and hear what He's got to say to us and um, see the way He ministers to us. If you hadn't been here in the past several weeks, we're, we've been going through the book of James. Just walking through it verse by verse, a little bit, of, little bit at a time, and just, uh, just seeing the way God ministers to us through the book of James. So I was told we have to be out here at 645. So in the words of that theologian, Jerry Reed, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So let's, uh, let's open up our Bibles to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Verses 14 through 26. That's where we're going to be. And I want to start us off by allowing us to just think on a quote that I'm sure many of you have heard before. Um, and it's a quote that I want us to reflect on as we walk through this Bible study tonight. And it's a quote by Billy Graham. And he said this, he said, If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Who's heard that quote before? Just listen to that again. If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So just think on that thought as we walk through, through this tonight. So 
I want us to just walk verse by verse as we go through this. And as you see, if you have titles and headings on, in your Bible, you'll see that in front of verse 14, this section is titled, Faith Without Works is Dead. Faith Without Works is Dead. And for many, many years, this little passage of Scripture has been a controversy in a lot of churches. Because we go through life and we say, well, aren't we saved by faith? Well, what does it say in, what is this works deal that, that we're talking about? We're, we're saved by faith, right? So as we walk through this, um, it's important when you read any book of the Bible, any scripture, to understand what the context of that scripture is, so you'll know what we're talking about here. So James is writing to Christians who have a Jewish background that have, have understood this glory of salvation by, by faith. They, they know the freedom of this works righteousness, but they have gone to the other extreme now where they're saying that works don't matter at all. So they're professing this faith, and there's nothing to prove for it because works don't matter. So James is addressing these people, and the point that he's trying to make as we walk through this text, just to go ahead and lay that out, is that faith is what saves you, but our works are the evidence of our faith. Faith is what saves you, but works is the evidence of your faith. So he starts off addressing this. Look at verse 14 as we start. What good is it, my brothers? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that faith save him? So he's addressing this question right out of the, right out of the gate here. It, can that faith save him if, if he has no works? Now, it's important to understand that James really is a, is a practical book for our lives as Christians. A lot of people say it's, it, it's got a little flair of that wisdom literature like you see in, in Proverbs, and, and, and James is really the Old Testament Proverbs wrapped up in New Testament clothes and telling us what we need to do practically to show our faith. So he's addressing this question, and as he addresses this question, he gives an illustration in verses 15 through 16 what he's talking about. So look at verses 15 and 16. It says, if a brother or sister, sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? What good is that? So in other words, has there been a time in your life where somebody has come to you, they're struggling, they're dealing with just some messy stuff in their life, and they're just pouring their heart out to you. And you say, well, I wish you best. See you later. That's what he's talking about here. That's what he's talking about. Our words really don't mean anything in that situation. You know, there's been several times that I've, I've been with people who is going through difficult situations in life. And one of the things that I always hear is I, I, never, I never remember what people say to me when I'm going through those valleys. But you know what they say? I always remember who was there. I always remember who was there for me in those times of struggle, in those times of, of difficulty. You know, the ministry of a presence is really the greatest ministry that you can ever have and just being there doing for people serving people loving people what does that look like well i mean people are struggling pastor buddy always talks about those casseroles right he always brings up those casseroles for some reason go do life with them actually help them bear the burden that they're going through love on them Love on them. So he's given this illustration and telling and really calling out what, what they're doing. And through this, he's calling us to action. He's calling us to do something. 
if you've really been changed, if you've really been saved, if God has really transformed your life, go do something about it. Go live it out. You know, action really is the greatest form of discipleship that we can give. Do people see a difference in our lives? That, that's the question. Can people see that God has come into our lives and, and transformed us and they can see a joy and a hope and a peace and there's just something different about us that they don't have? To a point where they can say, I, I see this going on in your life. I see something different. Tell me about what you have. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people go up to, to people who are truly pursuing and following the Lord and say, just tell me about why you're so happy all the time. Well, I got Jesus in my heart. It's by action. He's calling us to action. There's a, there's a, it's a newer song by um, the Sidewalk Prophets, and it's called Live Like That. And there's a line in that, that song and it says, when people pass, even if they don't know my name, is there evidence that I've been changed? When they see me, do they see you? I want to live like that. Give it all I have so that everything I say and do is worship to you. Do people see a difference in our lives? That's living out our faith. What is, what is our reaction when people need help? You know what the cop-out is? I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. You see it on Facebook all the time. Please pray for me in this. And people have the, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Have you ever thought about how many people who say I'm praying for you actually praying for you? Practically speaking, somebody asks you for prayer, say, all right, let's pray. Pray for them right there. First off, they're shocked <laughs> that somebody would do that. And you're not lying to them. You're praying for them. You're doing something. You're living out your faith. You're showing your faith by action. But then in verse 17, James is showing the point of this illustration that he's just given. And he's saying, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's dead. And that's James' thesis for, for this passage, that faith without works is dead. I mean, this whole book, like I said, is Christianity that's practically lived out. It's this testing of our faith. And, and as we've gone through James so far, there's been two examples where he's talked about the testing of our faith. You remember what those are? What's the first one? James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, we're tested by trials. How do we respond to trials? Is it with joy? Understanding that that trial has already been overcome by Christ? And though we suffer now, there's ultimate victory, whether in this life at some point or the next, because Jesus has already won and defeated that very battle that you're going through. That's how we're able to count it as joy. And then we get into, into chapter 2, and that second test is by our works. Our faith is proved by our works. James is calling us to a living faith. A living faith. So what does a living faith look like? I just want to give you a few examples of, of what this living faith looks like. Number one, it's growing to be more like Jesus. A living faith, we have a desire to grow to be more like Jesus. It's that big word we hear, sanctification. Simplified growing in holiness to be more like Jesus every day? Do we have a desire to be more like Jesus? Secondly, are we obeying God's commandments? Obeying God's commandments. Third, are we caring for each other? Caring for each other. Do we love each other? 
Next one, are we trusting God even in our valleys? Even in our brokenness? Are we trusting in God? Are we resisting temptation? Are we resisting temptation? And lastly, it's enduring the race to the very end. It's pressing on toward the goal of the upper calling of Christ Jesus our Lord until we stand before Him face to face and hear the words that we all should desire to hear. And it's the words from God looking at us and saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your master. That's the goal. That's what we press on towards. So are we living for that? So those are just some practical ways of what a living faith looks like. And, and for us to gain a proper perspective on this faith and works issue, James talks about this in verse 18. He says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So there's this, there's this arguing going on here. And the Jews were arguing of, my faith's better than your faith. How do you know? You're not doing any works. You believe more than I believe? So James is saying, you can argue about this, but... I will show you my faith by my works. It's not just talking the talk. It's walking the walk. I'll show, it, show you my faith by my works. And this living faith by your works, you bear fruit. It's that scripture in Matthew 7 that every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears Bad fruit. So are we bearing that good fruit? Are we showing our faith by the way we love? By the way we care? By the life we live? But then when we get to verse 19, there's kind of a turn of events. Because James transitions to what a dead faith looks like. We just talked about a living faith. But then he goes into what does a dead faith look like? So look at verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. They tremble. They fear. You see, not all belief, not all belief is saving faith. Not all belief is saving faith. The demons knew God. They have seen God. They have been with God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They, they know them. But they're not following Him. They're not pursuing Him. They're not living for Him. They know who God is. But they're not following Him. So, so they tremble because they know that He is the God of mercy he's the god of judgment so they they tremble and and, and that these demons they hate god that's the biggest difference and i believe what he's doing is he's going back to to deuteronomy chapter 6 verse verse 4 where he says hero israel the lord your god is one and you shall love the lord your god with all your heart your soul your mind and your strength you see head knowledge doesn't save there has to be a connection between the cranial and the cardiological, the, the thought and the feeling. Your mind has to speak through your heart. And your heart's got to overflow with who God is and the way and the way you live. And the way you live. But then, as, as we continue to move through this passage of Scripture, and through verse 21, he, he's continuing to hammer on this. And he's bringing up examples of, of Abraham and Rahab. So look at this, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he, was all, when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Hmm, interesting. We'll come back to that. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead as well. So you know the stories of of Abraham and, and Rahab. You know Abraham took his son up to the altar to be sacrificed to show his, his, his loyalty to God. And, and before he had to do it, God said, now you, you've proven your faith. And then you have Rahab and Jericho when the spies came. All she had to do was go tell the authorities of Jericho and, and she, would have, she would have shown that she was still loyal to her idols rather than God. But instead of telling those authorities, she basically turned away from her city She turned away from her authority. She turned away from her family. And in doing that, she showed her faithfulness to God. You see, many think that this part right here, as I talked about, that this is the scripture that contradicts Paul's writing on justification by faith. But it all goes back to context. We've got to understand what the writers, who the writers are writing to. So, where Paul was setting forth doctrines of the Christian faith, doctrinally speaking, justification is by faith alone. Justification, fancy word for our right standing before God, is by faith alone. And James is setting forth these principles of daily living. So Paul's talking about the doctrines of the faith. James is talking about Christian living. Okay? So in daily living, our salvation, which is by faith alone is displayed by our good deeds. And that's the whole point that James is trying to make. Though our salvation is, is by faith, our works is evidence of our faith. So doctrinally speaking, we're saved by faith alone. Practically speaking, faith must be shown through action or it's dead. So doctrine is good, knowledge is important, but actions are truly the window to our heart. So here's what I want us to do for just a second. If you look inside your worship guide, there's a piece of paper and it says one, two, one, two. All right. What? You've been writing on it? <laughs> well, my gracious. Flip it over. I'm, I'm just glad somebody took notes. So that, that makes me feel good. So just flip it over on the back. If you need one, Chad's got some in the back. As I said, I'm, I'm honored that you would take notes. Wow. Making you sit on your toes. See, I save my blanks for the very end because usually when the last blank is over, you start rustling the papers and you're packing up and you're done before I'm done. So I'm going to be done when you're done. That's the way I do these things. I should have told you that, but all right. If I'd have told you that, you wouldn't have taken notes and been asleep. So, so here's what I want us to do. On the first little section of number one and two, I want you to just take a pen And if you don't have a pen, we got some back there. And I want you to just write down two ways that your faith has changed how you live. Two ways that your faith has changed how you live. I'm not going to call on you, I promise. It's just for you. How your faith has changed how you live. You can't think of any. 
Go back and read James 2, 14 through 26. All right, once you've done that, I want you to go down to the next section. And I want you to write two ways that as you continue to grow in the Lord, how your actions need to be more aligned with how you can show your faith. What are two more things you can do to show your faith by action? Once you're done, just just stick that in your Bible. And when you open it, I want it to be a reminder to you. The first two that you've written down, proof that God has done work in your life. That there is fruit that you're bearing. That God is transforming your life. But let those other two be a reminder and a motivation That there's more that you can do for the kingdom of God. There's more you can do to be a witness. Because sanctification, the growing to be more like Jesus, will not be fully achieved until we're glorified. It's a lifelong process. So when you say, I've arrived... That's the most dangerous place you can be as a follower of Jesus. You can always grow to be more like Jesus. So use this as a reminder. The first two of God's faithfulness. But the second two as a reminder to press on towards the goal. God's good. Amen? Amen. God is good. God is good. But he, to much is given, much is required. He's blessed us with grace. Go do something about it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for James and the way he so bluntly just lays things out for us. The way he just steps on our toes and slaps us across the face when we need it the most. Father, I pray that as we continue to grow into who you've called us to be, as we continue to grow more to be like Jesus, that, Father, we would see ways that we can continue to minister to those around us. We can continue to see ways that we need to reflect Jesus in the way we live. Father, my hope and my prayer is that for myself and that for all of us here, That people would pass us just in the line at Walmart and say, there's something different about that person. There's something different. That the joy of Christ would radiate so bright that it can be seen from all over trustful. Father, continue to mold us, continue to grow us, continue to build us into your image. Father, we thank you for your word and for this time to gather together and study it as a church. Father, we love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Be safe in the rain going home. God bless you, and we hope to see you on Sunday morning.